Well, hi. Looks like the ugly stick got beaten with you. What? You didn't think you were Miss America, did you? Uh, oh, that hurt your feelings? Oh. Um, sorry. It's not personal. I don't know any better. Hey, hey, don't get mad at me. I'm a psychopath. I can't help it. See, if you get mad at me for hurting your feelings, then you're just intolerant of people with mental issues, and now I'm offended. I mean, would you get mad at a guy who had no legs if he didn't, like, carry you across, you know, a pond or something? What, do you, do you hate disabled people now? I mean, if you looked in the mirror, you're one to judge. No, I've got a card right here. Hang on. It's somewhere in here. Hey, would you mind getting me a drink while I'm looking at this? I'm not saying I'm allowed to do whatever I want. I'm just saying I can't control myself. And if you don't like it, well, that's your problem. Oh, can you validate my parking? No? We all like to think that people are getting worse over time, but uh, psychopaths have actually been with us from the very beginning. I mean, according to the Bible, the third human ever murdered the fourth human ever. And we were off to the races. Theophrastus was one of Aristotle's students, and he may be one of the first people in history to really talk about psychopaths, which he called the unscrupulous, because they're just daggum without scruples. Some examples of psychopaths in literature over the years include Medea from Greek mythology, King Shayar in the Book of the 1001 Nights, Richard III and Titus Andronicus from Shakespeare, Alex the Large in A Clockwork Orange, and Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs. Psychopathy comes from the words psych and pathy. Psych meaning the soul or the mind, and pathy meaning suffering or disease. Psychopaths are basically people without any kind of conscience or empathy. It was first described in a psychiatric setting by one of psychiatry's founding fathers, Philippe Pinel. He called it mania sans dédier, and people with this he described as having certain behavioral deficits. Deficits such as antisocial acts, drug and alcohol abuse, willfully cruel, irresponsible, and immoral. And he believed that the difference between these people and the rest of society was that they suffered from what he called an absence of confusion in the intellect. But the word psychopath came from the German psychiatrist J.L.A. Koch in 1888. He actually called it psychopastiche. And he believed it was the constitution of a person at birth that created this condition. But in the early 20th century, the word psychopath was actually used to describe anybody with any kind of shyness or insecure behavior. It was kind of a placeholder term for anybody that wasn't completely normal. Kind of like the word hysteria applied to pretty much anything women did. But the term psychopathy became a little bit more codified in 1941 with the book The Mask of Sanity by Dr. Hervey Cleckley. The mask in the title refers to the projection of normalcy that psychopaths can put out there. It's kind of a seminal book on the subject and it was based on a wide variety of studies on uh, psych psychopaths out there in the world and 50 years on it's still considered one of the most influential works on the subject. But the first person to really like put together a test to determine whether or not somebody was a psychopath was Dr. Robert Hare in 1980. It's known as the Hare by professionals and it includes 20 different personality traits that can indicate whether or not somebody's a psychopath. And just in case you're wondering what they are and you know if you want to check and make sure you're all right or anybody that you know, here's here's the list right here. Here's all 20 of them. I'm just going to let them kind of do their thing. And if you're watching that list and you're like, oh my God, that's my boyfriend and that's my boyfriend and that's my boyfriend, get out, girl. Get out. And by the way, there also is an extra interesting finding about psychopaths. They like bitter tasting foods. In a study published in the journal Appetite in 2016, researchers were able to show that, quote, participants confirmed the hypothesis that bitter taste preferences are positively associated with malevolent personality traits with the most robust relation to everyday sadism and psychopathy. It was the overall strongest predictor compared to other taste preferences. And the participants who didn't like bitter taste tended to be more agreeable and cooperative and sympathetic. Yeah, so all those people drinking kale shakes out there? Psychopaths. And it's thought that they prefer bitter taste because they have this need for stimulation. That's kind of something that's prevalent amongst psychopaths is that their senses and their emotions are dulled. So they're always seeking stronger and stronger stimulations and risk, you know, risky behaviors and whatnot. And let's face it, few things are as thrilling as hurting other people. So what exactly causes someone to be a psychopath? 
Now there has been some research that suggests that there's reduced brain activity in certain parts of the brain that have to do with emotion and decision making, like in the amygdala, which I covered in a recent video. This means they showed less activity and blood flow in those regions of the brain when they were showed images of people in distress or when they had to face like the consequences of their actions. But this opens up a question because we know about neuroplasticity in our brain. We know that our behaviors and our thinking patterns can actually change the way our brains are shaped. So is it the shape of our brains that causes us to be psychopaths or is it the fact that we're psychopaths that changes the structure in our brain? So one way to answer that is to look at identical twins and adopted children. And those studies seem to suggest that unemotional psychotic behavior and thought patterns actually do have a genetic component to them. That those genes have more of an influence on someone than antisocial behavior itself. But when it comes to adopted children, those genes seem to be able to be counteracted by environmental and parental influences as well. Some recent research from Vanderbilt University seems to suggest that uh, psychopaths are hardwired to seek reward at any cost. Like they have a hyper-reactive dopamine reward system that may be amplifying their behaviors. By the way, you might be wondering, what's the difference between a psychopath and a sociopath? Well, they're both considered antisocial personality disorders, but there are a few little differences. A sociopath disregards society's laws, morals, orders, and values, and whatnot, and has purely selfish interests, but they don't go out with an intent to hurt others, they just want to do what pleases them. A psychopath disregards humanity entirely, intentionally chooses to hurt others, deliberately makes plans to use others that satisfy their personal goals, and to them, people are nothing more than just objects. One simple way of looking at it is a sociopath is basically just unrestrained, whereas a psychopath is premeditative. So hearing those traits might give you the impression that all psychopaths are dangerous. This actually isn't true. Chances are you've worked for a psychopath because they are actually, because of their narcissistic tendencies, they're attracted to higher positions of power like CEOs or politicians. I mean, sure, you can make the argument that politics are dangerous, but when you think about a psychopath, you think Patrick Bateman, not so much Patrick Leahy. Which begs the question, how do you know if you're dealing with a psychopath? Well, here are some traits to look out for. Overconfidence, insincere, irresponsible, selfish, doesn't understand metaphors or abstract ideas, but specializes in logic and reason. Shallow emotions, uncaring, has a parasitic lifestyle, chaotic behavior, has a high threshold for disgust, and doesn't look at a person's eyes when that person's having an emotional moment. Now, you might be looking at that list and seeing that some of those things apply to you. So, uh, does that mean you're a psychopath? <laughs> no. Unless you're a psychopath. Really, when testing these kinds of traits for psychopathy, it's not just about the traits themselves. It's really about more the intention behind those traits. Like somebody might have a little bit of narcissism or overconfidence, but that doesn't necessarily make them a psychopath. Now, if that is geared toward using other people for their benefit and not having any empathy for those people, well then, yeah, that you might be a psychopath. So is there any hope for somebody that's a psychopath? Can we change them in any way? Can you change yourself in any way if you're a psychopath? Or are you just destined to hurt other people for the rest of your life? Not necessarily. There are some studies being done at the Mendota Juvenile Treatment Center in Madison, Wisconsin that might give you a little bit of hope. On the youth psychopathy checklist, nearly all of the kids at the Mendota Treatment Center are tested as severe for potential psychopathy as adults. Psychopaths rarely give any kind of consideration to punishment. In fact, punishment tends to only harden their criminality. And psychopaths are six times more likely to commit more crimes after they leave prison. So the center decided to not focus on punishment so much, they kind of flipped the script and focused on positive reinforcement, what they call the decompression model. In the decompression model, signs of positive behavior, no matter what size, were reinforced with a reward, like candy bars or video games. And rewards could scale, meaning good behavior equals bigger prizes. So, did it work? Well, they studied 300 uh, participants that were in the Mendota Treatment Center and then some that were treated in other places with different models. And of those, after five years, only 64% of the treatment center youth were arrested compared to 98% of the non-treatment youth. That's a 34% reduction in recidivism. The Mendota Center youth were 50% less likely to commit a violent crime. And the treatment center youth didn't commit any homicides compared to the non-treatment center youth who killed 16 people after their release. Yikes. So it appears there's a lot of importance and a lot of weight in identifying these traits in kids when they're young and being able to teach them tools to be able to work through those as they get older. Or to use a cliche, a carrot is more effective than a stick. You know, there's a lot of misinformation out there about psychopathy. Just because somebody is, you know, defined as a psychopath does not necessarily mean that they're going to be violent. Most people want to do the right thing, even if they don't know what that right thing is. But still, if you think that somebody that you work with or somebody that you're involved with in some way might be a psychopath, you might want to keep your guard up. Just saying. 
So what do you think? Do you know anybody in your life that could be defined as a psychopath? Have you had any experiences with them? Got any crazy stories to tell? Share it down in the comments below. All right, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, um, Google thinks you might like this one too, so you might want to check that one out or look at any of the videos down here on the side that have my face on it. And if you like them and you enjoy them, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday and every Thursday. All right, with that, I thank you for watching. You guys go out, have an eye-opening rest of the week, and I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.